In this series of videos I'm attempting to repair and restore an Osborne OCC1 vintage computer. In the previous video in this series I used the logic analyzer to trace through the uh, boot up sequence to try to figure out why this machine won't boot from floppy disk. It comes, it powers up, the display comes up with a welcome screen um, asking me to insert the uh, boot disk uh, but when I then try and boot, it will start going through the boot process and then it will stop, but the machine will hang and it won't then go any further until I reset it. The screen doesn't change, so it's not getting very far through the boot process. So as I explained in the previous video, the startup sequence is for the, um, the ROM code, that's the monitor ROM, that's this ROM here, to uh, start running, there's a small amount of code in there, it accesses the image on the floppy disk, copies some code into this area, so it's um, in the, uh, this is the BIOS, BDOS and CCP uh, for CPM, and um, it should then start loading the rest of CPM but I think it was getting this far and stopping so in the previous video we went through this process and it did appear that it was successfully um, reading and copying the first couple of tracks of data which is uh, this block here copying it to RAM uh, or at least it thought it was copying it to RAM and then it was trying to start up the next phase in the CPM loading uh, which is to uh, set some default values and then start copying the main uh, CPM code. But it was stopping at that point and uh, obviously the uh, next step was to try and figure out why. Now going back and looking at the previous video you'll see that um, the system was kind of behaving properly, it was doing what we expected so a lot of it was working. Now you can see here that I've removed the two daughter boards and I've done that to kind of speed things along in this video but you can use the techniques I'm going to show here uh, without doing that, at least the first technique. And one of the skills in uh, fault finding uh, old vintage equipment like this is knowing when to change tack and move on to the next phase of repair. So uh, following on from the previous video I started tracing through the code going into CCP and the BIOS, so in particular we got to um, uh, a jump to the BIOS uh, code and uh, CPM is fairly consistent in the way it's um, it's configured the core of it is, is fairly consistent very rarely changes um, there are some details especially in things like the BIOS that change uh, but the overall process remains the same and if you're familiar with um, CPM you'll know that it uses the very bottom of RAM to store some important values so bearing in that, that in mind, I set the logic analyzer to trigger on address 5. If you're not quite sure why I would use address 5, then if you review the CPM documentation, it should become very clear. And I was hitting address 5 following on from the call to uh, BIOS. So it did look like the system was doing what it should do and also that the BIOS was starting to do what it should, but it wasn't succeeding. When I followed through, the, the uh, value at um, address 5 is really a vector, and when I followed through that, it wasn't jumping to the right place. It was going uh, somewhere strange and not doing what it should do. So looking at the value that was stored at address 5, it was incorrect. And in this video, we'll try and find out why the value there is incorrect, because it does tend to... Uh, indicate why CPM couldn't get any further and in particular why it crashed without giving any error messages. So um, I did start doing this without removing the daughter boards but um, I will uh, leave them off for now. It doesn't really make any difference whether they're there or not so that was the uh, double density interface card for the floppy drives and the display pack that gives the enhanced display. So what I did is remove these two boards and I took the character ROM and slotted it into the 
uh, main board. You don't need to do that. I just did that so I could test it more fully. The display won't work if you do this because part of the upgrade is to make some modifications. So although I have the display plugged in here, um, the only reason I have it plugged in is to put some load on the power supply. I don't want the power supply too lightly loaded for reasons I explained in an earlier video. Uh, I've then got the Fluke 9010A connected using my Z80AA pod. Um, I mentioned in the previous video that this didn't work properly and I've shown a technique before, I think it was on the REN computer when it wouldn't work either. And it's because of the loading that's on the pod, especially when it has this board in. Uh, so what I do is I take out the main crystal and uh, in this case the crystal is a 15.974 MHz crystal and I replaced it with a 4 MHz crystal. It slows everything down and then the pod will work quite well. Now of course the system won't run like this because the timing's out for everything uh, but it will allow the 9010A to access the various parts of the system so that I can test it. So the first thing I want to do is test RAM. So if we uh, turn the camera onto the Fluke and what we're going to do here is test from 4000 upwards and I'll explain why it's 4000 upwards in a few minutes but the first thing we want to do is test this upper block. This uh, will work with the two daughter boards in and if you do have the daughter boards in you can actually see something on the display and you'll see when it gets to the upper section of the uh, test because it will start changing what's on the display. It's not a proper uh, display because the timing's all out but you can see it. Um, but with it like this uh, you can't see anything, it's not writing anything uh, sensible to the uh, data out or the video out um, so nothing changes on the display. It's just purely for loading purposes. Okay I'll move the camera and we'll look at the fluke and uh, try and see if we can uh, do some, some proper testing on the RAM. So I've powered up the Fluke. Um, I don't have the um, Osborne switched on yet so that's the next thing we'll do. We'll turn that on. So the Osborne is now switched on and we'll try and run this and see what happens. And it is running. It's um, If it doesn't run you'll get an error message on the Fluke. So that's running and what we can do now is some uh, basic RAM test. Just uh, We can either just write values to RAM. So if we want to, for example, write a value to address 8000, we'll write a value of 55, and then we'll try and read that back. And you'll see it's working. So we can now uh, do some sensible RAM tests on the uh, Osborne. So uh, what I'll do here is a, uh, a short RAM test. I will do a long RAM test uh, later, but it will take an hour or so um, on this machine at this clock uh, frequency. So do a RAM test. We'll go from 4000 up to the top of RAM. So this will take about 10 minutes and I'll come back once it's finished. OK, that took about 20 minutes and as you can see the test passed fine. So now we know that from 4000 up to top of uh, RAM is fine. But if we now try and use this uh, section lower down, so we'll go to address 2000 for example. If we try to uh, do a, a write to that address, so we'll write to address 2000. We'll write a value of 55 try and read that back and notice it's coming back with the wrong value. In fact if we try and do a RAM test, if we go from 1000 for example to 2000 and try and run this, it comes up with an error. And uh, there's a very good reason for this and um, we can see what that is if we try and read some other addresses. So if we try and read address 0 for example, we're getting a value of 31. And if we grab the listing for the monitor ROM, and this is the first page of it, address 0, we'll see that the value at address 0, the first value is 31. So the next one is, uh, next uh, value at uh, address 1 is C1. So if we try reading address 
one, we're getting C1. And the next one is EF, and that's EF. So the reason that um, we can't do a RAM test as things stand is because we're actually looking at the ROM. And you may recall from an earlier video I said that when the Osborne resets, it by default selects RAM Bank 2. So that's this one. And so what we're actually looking at here is this ROM bank. Now the only reason the RAM test succeeds is because the address space is not fully decoded. So in other words, it treats this second bank as a shadow RAM bank of the first from 4000 upwards. So so in other words, uh, this area from 4000 up uh, are in both bank 1 and bank 2 occupy the same space in the memory map. And so what we have to do is find a way to switch to bank 1 if we want to test the lower section of RAM. So I couldn't find anything in the technical documentation about how to do that, so I resorted to looking at the schematic and what I found uh, was this. So what we have here is the a bank control. It's just a series of flip-flops and a little bit of glue logic. And if you look at this carefully, uh, you'll see that it's controlled through the in-out pin and the uh, right pin of the CPU, uh, along with some other um, pins and two of those are the address 0 and address 1 pin and if you know how the Z80 works it then becomes fairly clear as to how to control this. So what we can do uh, armed with this information is uh, have a go at changing banks manually and what I want to do here of course is select uh, the second bank so I want to be able to, uh, sorry the first bank so I want to be able to switch from the second bank which is the one it defaults to on reset to this bank. So we can use the flute to do that and all we need to do is write to the port that um, this appears to be mapped to. So that seems to be port uh, 1. So if we try writing to port 1 and we write a value of look at this schematic 2 then that should switch our bank. So if we now try reading uh, address 1 again, so if you recall at this address before we had a value of C1. So if we try reading this now we're getting a different value. So we'll try writing a, a value to that. I'll try writing a value of 55. So write to address 0 a value of 55. We'll try reading that back and it seems to work. We'll try um, a different address, so we'll try address 2, write a value of 55, we'll try reading that back, and this time it's come back uh, incorrectly. So what we'll do is we'll try writing uh, a value of FF and then we'll try writing a value of uh, zero. We'll do that at address 2000 for example. So if we write to address 2000 which is in the middle of this bank that we're looking at and we'll write a value of FF. We'll read that back. Seems to be working but if we now try and write a value of zero and read that back notice we're getting a value of four. So again, anyone familiar with this is probably already guessing that we have what appears to be a stuck bit. We'll now try and do a short RAM test just to confirm this. So we'll start at address 1 and we'll go up to address 100 for example. Start it running and immediately we get the same thing. So um, uh, we've got a bit fault at address 1 and it's saying that um, uh, we're, we're getting a value of 4 when it should be 0. So we'll um, go back over to the uh, machine and have a look at it and try and figure out what's going on. Now I would say at this point I found all this before I took the boards out. Uh, all I did initially was replace the crystal and this worked fine with the two daughter boards uh, in place. The only reason I took them off is to show you something else that I have mentioned in previous videos but is another useful 
a fault finding tool. If you have a thermal camera, I know most people don't, but they're getting fairly cheap these days. Um, one thing that seems to uh, be assumed is that faulty parts get hot and that's not always the case as I pointed out before faulty parts can be cold now what you notice uh, here hopefully is right where the crosshair is on the thermal camera image if that's coming across there's a dark patch in fact it's almost blue at that point that's pointing directly at this third IC if we look at the schematic then the address that we are interested in is the lower 16k block and that's this upper row of ICs the, and they're on uh, row A which is this row and the particular bit we're interested in is bit 2 that's for the value 4 that we're seeing and that's this um, IC here that's IC um, 25 so that's A25 and that's the third one in which is the one that's looking extremely cold so if we go back put the thermal camera back on there I'm hoping you can see that there is a dark area right where that I see is and so that does tend to confirm things you can use a thermal camera this I see is actually running cold uh, so it's, it's clearly not doing anything and uh, so that's just one thing to bear in mind if you're using a thermal camera to fault find just bear in mind some components might be too cold not necessarily too hot so that uh, seems to be what the issue is here that um, we've got a failed RAM chip the reason that CPM is most likely failing to start up and not showing any error messages is that because if this is the lower memory bank then the area up to 100 hex especially the first few bytes where um, CPM stores some fairly important values are not being stored correctly and then when it tries to use those to kind of leap off into some uh, meaningful code and do something such as finishing loading CPM it just hangs the machine because it's not actually jumping to the right part of code so what I'll do for the next video is I'll take this IC out I'll put a socket in that uh, uh, space and then we'll rerun the test and see if that solves the problem and if it does we'll plug everything back together and see if we can get any further through the boot process.